Happy Sabbath again. It's always so great to hear April play her flute. I, I wish I knew the words to some of the songs, but you can tell that they're so gentle, they're so serene, that they're meant to bring you into a heavenly atmosphere. So April, thank you so very much. I look forward to the day when we'll have you back in the sanctuary and we can hear it and feel the vibrations of it uh, here with us. I wonder if you'd be kind enough just to bow your heads with me as we look at the word of God for study. Father in heaven, we, we are grateful for your Sabbath. We're grateful for the rest from the week. We're grateful to come closer to you now. So we ask, Lord, that you would do the needful for each person who is listening to now your words that will come. Because your words will be ushered to them, Father, I, I ask that you would, you would cause me to be hidden behind the cross, cover me completely with the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, so that uh, your words might be translated into my words, so that I will not be an obstacle for the heart who needs to hear and accept the call of Jesus Christ today. I ask, Lord, that you bless our time now with the power of your Holy Spirit. This I ask in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'd like to turn your attention to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. And as you do so, I would ask that you would turn your attention to the third chapter. I'm grateful uh, that Sister Knowles read for us, or a scripture reading, and what she read was the message in part of Jesus to the Laodicean church. I will not have time to fool around with all of these wonderful verses today. Um, I will focus on one, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. It is a well-known text but let me read it for you. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. This, of course, is in the context of the message that Christ has for the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church is near dead. They think they're rich, but they are not. They think they're well-to-do, but they are not. They think they're healthy because of their, their prosperity financially, but they are not. They think they're innovative in medicine, but it is not enough. They think they're okay, but they're near dead. And Christ comes and offers spiritual life. And so as it turns out, as they follow the enemy and the way of the world, the enemy drains their life. But thank God, we now know that Jesus sustains our life. The enemy drowns our, drains our life, but Jesus sustains our life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Standing at the door, therefore waiting at the door. 
knocking at the door. And the text also says, if you hear my voice, so therefore he's calling at the door. Can you imagine Jesus on the outside trying to get on the inside, but will not force himself? He gives you choice. He's standing and waiting for you. He is knocking at the door. He is calling. He is not quietly doing so as the paintings that we've seen with the gentle knock. I can imagine the anxiety in the heart of Jesus wondering, will you open up for me? And he refuses to stop knocking and calling. He refuses to leave. He's standing there, but he will not force himself inside. This, this measure by Christ, this behavior by Christ, this deportment by Christ, is to be contrasted with the enemy of Christ, the enemy of mankind, the devil himself. We find in Matthew 12, 43 through 45, you can put a pen on that. We won't focus too much on it today. I'll just remind you that during that time, Jesus himself says that when an unclean spirit is cast out of a man, that he goes around trying to find another home. And, and when he cannot find another home, he comes back to where he was before, but he brings seven buddies with him, worse than him, and he sneaks in behind him. And the case of that person is worse than when he started. So they had a spiritual uh, a victory. Some demon was cast out of them. It may have been anger. It may have been profanity. It may have been lust. It may have been anxiety. It may have been depression. But something has been cast out. But lo and behold, when the enemy comes back, this person is eight times worse than they were before. But these unclean spirits don't knock at the door. They break in to the house and they overtake the house without invitation. So from this, we see that the enemy drains our life, but Jesus sustains our life. And one must also take note as we look at Revelation of whose door he's standing at. He stands at the door, really at the heart of the unworthy. Look with me to Luke chapter 15 and verse 28. We'll come back to Revelation shortly. You know I can hardly do a sermon without touching Luke 15. It means so much to me. Luke 15, we won't mess with the sheep. We're not going to mess with the coins. Uh, we're not going to mess even with the prodigal son that much. I want to talk about his older brother. Luke 15, verse 28, we know that a party is being put on now by the father because the younger son, the prodigal, has come home and he's safe. They've killed the fatted calf. There, there's music, there's dancing, there's celebration, there's joy, there's happiness. And when the older son comes, he finds out that the person who's being celebrated is his younger brother who has been away. Verse 28 of Luke 15 says, and he was angry and would not go in. What is God to do with those of us who are angry and will not celebrate the blessings that God has for others? What does God do with those of us who are depressed about the things that are happening in the world and we think we can't go on anymore? What does God do with those of us who are broken because others have harmed us and hurt us? Here, the father comes out. And the father is not angry. He does not mirror the sinful nature of his son. No, the father entreats him. The story ends with the father pleading with the son's heart outside the celebration. And the father, just like the son, refuses to go in. The father refuses to go into the celebration without his son. The story ends with the two of them on the outside of the celebration. The son is full of envy. He is full of discord, anger, hatred, disappointment, disillusion. And if you're like him in any way in your life, I want you to know the father is there knocking, pleading, 
entreating you. He stands at your door as unworthy as you and I are. He stands at our door. Jeremiah 17, 9 makes clear through the word of God who we are as unworthy. The heart, it says, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then God asks the question, who can know it? He stands at the Laodicean heart in Revelation. The Laodicea believes that they're okay, but they're not. And he stands at the Laodicean heart. He first compares their spiritual state to their state of warm water that comes in. They don't have access to natural water, so they built aqueducts that go some six to nine miles, and one comes from hot springs and the other comes from uh, cold running water, but either one of these aqueducts, once they come, because of the distance, the water is lukewarm. Don't you, don't you despise drinking lukewarm liquid? And in fact, Jesus says that because you're lukewarm, uh, this is distasteful to me. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. The original language is not that tasteful. The original language says, I will vomit you out. That is how distasteful the behavior, the life, the character of the Laodicean church is to God. And he goes and he calls them further. He says, you are miserable. You are poor. Now, don't get upset with me. These are God's words. Uh, you are miserable. You are poor. You are blind. And you are naked. And the Greek for that word naked means extreme poverty. This is the state of the Laodicean, the Laodicean church. Yet... This same unworthy church, Christ is fueled by his love to encourage them. In verse 19, he beckons at the door of their hearts as he does to ours today. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He pleads to the latest in heart as he does yours today. He wants to give them what they need so that they can be sustained, so that they can have life. And he wants to enter into your heart to give you what you need so that you can have sustained life. This is why Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The enemy drains my life. But glory to God, Jesus sustains my life. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It would appear at first uh, that the door is the obstacle. It is a thing that stands between uh, the Savior and the sinner. It is the, it is the blockade. It is a thing to get around. It is a thing to move. It would uh, appear that way, but I would refer you to a little small word in this text. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then the word says, if any man. This if reveals that human choice is really the separator, that human choice is the real obstacle, uh, for the door is within the power of human choice. The door is not activated on its own. The human heart is what opens the door. So if any man hear my voice, the Savior, the song says, is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he's waited before, and now he's waiting again to see if you're willing, if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he 
wants to come in. If you take one step towards the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him, and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart, he'll abide. You know, there is an artist, William Holman Hunt. Some of you may not know of him. I learned of him recently. He died in 1910, so he's not relevant to our century here uh, for us. But he was an artist, a painter, and his most well-known work was called The Light of the World. Uh, it is currently uh, within St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England. It is a painting of Jesus Christ. He's standing at the door of a cottage. And the door has long been unopened. And so there are weeds and wild flowers and things that have, have encroached upon and taken space upon the entrance. Christ is pictured in the dark with a lantern in his hand. And with his other hand, he is ready. He is positioned to knock on this door. When Hunt first did this piece and it was revealed, a friend of Hunt who cared for him said, hey, hey, can we pull you aside? Let me talk to you. Uh, uh, it's a nice painting. It's in fact, it's magnificent, but uh, you've made a terrible mistake. He said, oh yes, what is that mistake? And he says, well, there's no knob or no handle on the door. To which Hunt is supposed to have replied, it was no mistake. That door opens only from the inside. You and I have a choice. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, hear my voice. I will come in to him and will sup with him. Behold, I stand. Behold, I wait. Imagine the Lord Jesus Christ standing, our Savior waiting, our King knocking, our Redeemer calling, the suffering servant who died for the world waiting, the Rock of Ages standing by, the Rose of Sharon calling, the Lily of the Valley knocking, our high priest waiting, the word of God calling, the creator of the world, the one who gives you breath, standing by for you, waiting for you, calling on you, little you, little me. Behold, I stand at the door knocking, and I wonder if you have thought about the tremendous display of grace, of love, of compassion that God makes in that he gives us the power of choice. If any man hear my voice. So that today, this day right now, when you hear this, that you have in your own hands the ability the power to say yes or no to God himself. If any man hear my voice, think <laughs> that the Lord Jesus Christ, the object of worship of angels, the active agent in the creation of all that was created on earth, that he is outside my door calling, outside your door, standing outside our door, knocking, waiting on our choice so that he could sustain our life? Is this where he is? Is he not vaulted to the height of our experience? Is he really on the outside, desiring to be on the inside? God is knocking. 
wonder what the response is while he's at the door of our hearts. If any man hear my voice, amid all the things that you're dealing with, amid all of the political upheaval and the, the, the job situations and your marital status and your family stuff and uh, all the, the worldly things that you want and the things you aspire to and the friends in your air and uh, the loved ones and the folk who don't like you and the noise of the world and COVID the pandemic and traveling restrictions and locked in your house and can't move around and it, amid all of the noise of the world, world, is it possible that God is knocking and you have been so distracted you have not heard his voice? If any man hear my voice and open the door, opening the door is in your hands. Have you ever uh, uh, been sick before but not been able to get the medication? Imagine if you just had the medication in your hands, but, but here is Christ knocking on the door with the remedy for our life so that we might be sustained because the devil has drained us, but he wants to sustain us. And imagine all I've got to do is open the door to get the remedy for this life. It is in our power to say yes or no to God. Yes, come in, or no, I will not have you today. But read carefully the text and look at what I love. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. Uh, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him. Uh, I'll take whatever he has in his house. So we find the Lord explaining to us, trying to, to coax us, trying to invite us, explaining to us on the outside of the door what he'll do when he comes on the inside of the door. He's saying, uh, don't have to fix yourself up. You don't have to get perfect. That whatever it is you have, is good enough for me. If you're dealing with anger, I'll take it. Just let me in. If you're dealing with depression, I'll take it. Just let me in. If it's insecurity, I'll take it. Just let me in. If you're guilty because you did wrong, I'll take it. Just let me in. If it's doubt that you have, I'll take it. Just let me in. If it's brokenness because of what they did to you, I'll take it. Just let me in. If it's weakness because you fall to the same thing, time and time again. I'll take it. The devil has drained you. I want to sustain you. Just let me in. He's saying it does not have to be pure, your life or your house or your heart. He is aware who you are. He knows you can't do pure by yourself. You need him to come in so that you can be sustained. It does not have to be righteous, your heart, your life. He is aware that you can't do righteous by yourself. The Bible says that even in almost righteous state, our righteousness is as filthy rags. He knows we need the righteous robe of Jesus Christ. We cannot do righteous by ourselves. So he says, whatever you have, I'll take it. The tainted life choices and circumstances, I'll take it. I will come in and sup with him and I will accept whatever he has. God in glory will accept whatever you have in your heart right now. He just wants to be in your heart right now. I will come in and sup with him. But then the figure changes and he with me. You know, if you move into a new neighborhood, there is a social norm in some neighborhoods that the existing neighbors will welcome you by bringing some food. 
uh, bringing something and saying, welcome to the neighborhood. And you'll take that in as the goodwill of those who you will live with. And Jesus wants to abide in your heart. He wants to live in your house. He wants to be with you. And, and he does not come empty handed. He's knocking. He's calling. He's waiting. He's standing. But when he comes in, though, he takes whatever it is that you have prepared for him. Whatever your life is, he accepts that. But the figure changes, it says, and he with me. So not only will Jesus partake of what you have, but you will partake of what Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has. And so the guest in this fashion becomes the host. For wherever God enters, he establishes himself there. God will establish himself in your heart. He will become the host. He, he in fact, welcomes you in your own house. He accepts you in your own house. He gives you his bread to eat in your own house. He gives you his manna from heaven in his own house. He gives you blessings to savor and his favor to experience all in your own house. He gives us his heavenly menu in our house. He just wants to come in. He says, I will sup with him, but that's not all. And he with me. What a privilege we have that when God comes in, I don't have to worry that I didn't cook enough because he's got some stuff for us to eat as well. I am the guest of God. He welcomes me, he anticipates me, he accepts me, and he just seems to just want to be around me. I will sup with him and he with me. Though life is rough, the struggle is real. <laughs> the enemy drains us. It's good to know that while Jesus is knocking, while he's standing, while he's waiting, while he's calling, his intent is the opposite of the enemy. The enemy drains us, but Jesus wants to sustain us. And you know very well, I hope you know, my dear friend, that when you let Jesus in, when you open the door and you said, I give up the world, just come in, Jesus, and do what you need to do. Something happens in the heart when you let Jesus in the house. Something happens in the heart. You live differently now that Jesus is inside. I want to turn your attention to a story that I've not spoken to you of a whole lot. But turn with me to Luke chapter 19, chapter 19 of Luke. I want to read something for you. Uh, Luke chapter 19. Oh, I ran past it. Luke chapter 19. And I'm not going to read the entire narrative for you. Uh, but Jesus was walking um, uh, through Jericho. And there is a, a, a man who, who could not see him. You would recommend, remember his name as Zacchaeus. And, and so Zacchaeus was a short fellow and, and could not see Jesus because the crowd was much taller than him. So he ran ahead of where Jesus was going to come and he climbed the sycamore tree and, and he looked down and he was able to see Jesus when Jesus passed. But that's not enough. When you look to Jesus, Jesus looks to you. You need to understand that if you draw nigh to Jesus, that Jesus draws nigh to you. This is what James 4 says, yes? And he's in the tree and he's looking down on Jesus. And when Jesus gets to the spot and he's moving with the crowd, he stops and the crowd stops and Jesus looks up. And here's what he says in verse 5, Luke 19, verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. I want Jesus to come by and tell me, Lance, I must abide in your heart. I must abide in your house, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus' response is what our response ought to be. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I should not have hesitation to bring Jesus into my heart. I should not have hesitation to bring Jesus into my house. I need him to clean up my life. You need to have him clean up your life. The devil has drained your life. You need Jesus around so that he can sustain your life. Well, Zacchaeus did not make play with this. He ran down that tree and he greeted him with joy. 
And the next verse says, and when he saw it, and when they saw it, they all murmured saying that he was gone to be the guest of a man that is a sinner. And they had not listened to the words of Jesus. Had they listened to the words of Jesus over time and time again, they would have known that he has come, that they might have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. That he has not come to call the perfect, but he's come to call the sinners. Zacchaeus is unworthy, and that's where he'll be. I am unworthy, and this is where he'll be. You, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, are unworthy, and that's where he'll be. Knocking on your door, calling, pleading, standing, refusing to leave you. Jesus on the outside, knocking. Zacchaeus did not let him wait at all. Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Here is a heart changing now that Jesus is in the house. Here is a heart changing because Jesus is present. And all Zacchaeus had to do was to accept Jesus in his house. And his heart melted because the Savior was there. And Jesus then says, and Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house. I want you to know that something happens in the heart when Jesus is in the house. Let him in. We will not have time to go through all of these stories, but I'll tell you that Peter, in Luke chapter 4, uh, Jesus came to Peter's house, and Jesus was concerned about the health of, of Peter's mother-in-law, and he healed her uh, from her flu, and she was well enough to go ahead and prepare some things for them. And then at sunset in that very same house, the Bible says in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 4 that everyone in the city who was sick came to the house where Jesus was, Peter's house. Something happens in the house when Jesus is there. And all those folk who came were healed. And then we've got Darius's daughter. Uh, you, you know that well. Mark chapter 5, little 12-year-old girl who dies. And Jesus says, don't you worry. Don't fret. I'm coming to your house. And when Jesus comes to the house, what was dead becomes alive. Who was dead becomes alive. The situation that seemed dead was now living. Yes, the enemy drained her life. But Jesus sustained her life. Something happens in the heart when Jesus is let into the house. When Jesus enters your house, your heart is changed like Zacchaeus. When he enters your house, healing takes place like in Peter's house. When Jesus enters your house, the dead receive like life like Jairus's daughter. When Jesus enters your house, your heart is filled, your heart burns, your eyes are opened. The enemy does drain your life, but Jesus sustains your life. And all of this sustainment is contingent on your answer because the door is not the blockade. Your heart is the blockade. Your choice is the blockade. Will you hear the voice of the Lord? Will we answer when he calls? Will we open the door? Will we let him into our hearts? There is a song, into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Anyone hearing me right now, if you open the door of your heart to Jesus, you can sing or tell or testify these words that I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one, lay down your head upon my breast. Jesus, right now, outside, calling, standing, waiting, knocking. What will be your answer to Jesus today? He's knocking for that situation that only you are aware of. He's knocking that situation that no one else needs to know. He's knocking. The Savior is waiting 
to enter your heart. My question, why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, come into our hearts. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus. Come in today. We beg, come in to stay. Come, please, Lord, into our hearts now, Lord Jesus. Those who need to be rescued, Father, from their, the elasticity of their decision-making, those who need to be rescued, Father, from their doubt, from their depression, from their anger, from their concerns, from their insecurities, from their troubles. Keep knocking. Keep calling. Never leave them. Never leave us. We invite you to come in now, Father. Please, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that sermon. Our closing hymn is number 625. That's number